Welcome to Overlooked, a podcast produced by Tunuka Media. My name is Yemi, and I'll be your host for the show. Released weekly, I share Overlooked stories from around the world with you. This will include the good, the bad, the weird, and sometimes the absolutely hilarious. Come back often, share with your friends, and feel free to add the podcast to your regular podcast rotation, wherever you get your podcasts. You can also connect on social media. Just search for Tunuka Media. That is T-U-N-U-K-A Media. If you learned something new, kindly support the show. Give Overlooked a like or a high rating. This would really help the show grow and get more people like you to learn something new. Finally, if you come across stories or articles that you think should be featured here, please don't hesitate to share them. Now, it's time for this week's episode. Hello everyone, hope you had a fantastic, fantastic week. Welcome to another episode of Overlooked. We've got some very good stories this week, so how about we just get right into it. In Mexico, the search for a two and a half year old boy, Dylan Isol Gomez Perez, who was led away from a market in southern Mexico three weeks ago, led the police to a horrifying discovery of 23 abducted children that were being kept at a house and forced to sell trinkets on the street. Prosecutors in Chiapas State said that most of the children were between the ages of 2 and 15 years old, but there were three babies aged between 3 and 20 months, were also found during the raid that took place on Monday the 20th at the house in the colonial city of San Cristobal de las Casas. San Cristobal is a picturesque, heavily indigenous city that is popular among tourists. It is not unusual to see children and adults hawking local crafts, like carvings and embroidered cloth, on its narrow cobblestone streets. According to the Chiapas State Prosecutor's Office, the children were forced through physical and psychological violence to sell handicrafts in the center of the city. Also, the kids showed malnutrition and precarious conditions. Dylan, whose disappearance led to the find, was led away by a young girl who appeared to be about 13 years old, which raises the possibility that some of the children were used to abduct other kids. Thank goodness that he was well and the other kids were found. Um, Here's to hoping that they do get some justice. Our next story this week takes us to the United States. Unlike some states that are sending out absentee ballots to registered voters because of the pandemic, Tennessee officials require residents to give a reason if they want an absentee ballot. Maybe they're older, have a disability, or it's decided that it's impossible or unreasonable to vote in person due to COVID-19. But if you're someone who just wants to vote early, that doesn't work. This comes in handy, for example, if you have to work on the designated voting day. One of the state's laws says that one reason you could get an absentee ballot is an observance of a religious holiday that prevents you from voting in person during the early voting period and on election day. So if there was, say, a religion that simply declared election day or any election a holiday, then it would serve as a legitimate reason to request a ballot no matter who you are. Hmm, what to do? Now I introduce you to the Church of Universal Suffrage, an officially registered nonprofit religious organization that exists purely to circumvent voter suppression in Tennessee. It was established earlier in June 2020 by Team Jacobs. From his description, the church holds regular weekly Sunday services 
where they meditate on the nature of voter suppression and corruption. The church also holds every voting day in the United States to be an official holiday reserved for meditation on the nature of voter suppression and in celebration of the inalienable right to vote, among other things, including life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The beauty of this church is that all members, and anyone can be a member, can simply tell Tennessee officials their religion considers Election Day a holiday. Therefore, they need an absentee ballot. According to the church's website, they will never ask for offerings. What they do ask is that you donate to a local charity of your choice. This man deserves a medal. Anyway, the link to the church is going to be in the bio, along with all other sources, as usual. Staying with the U.S., Paul Bishop from Comparitech found that Amazon's facial recognition platform misidentified an alarming number of people and was racially biased. Who would have guessed? Recognition, spelled with a K, not a C, Amazon's cloud-based facial recognition platform that was first launched in 2016 has been sold and used by a number of United States government agencies, including ICE and Orlando, Florida police, as well as private entities. So in comparing photos of a total of 1,959 U.S. and U.K. lawmakers to subjects in an arrest database, Bishop found that recognition misidentified an average of 32 members of Congress. That is four more than a similar experiment that was conducted by the American Civil Liberties Union, or ACLU. Bishop also found that the platform was racially biased misidentifying non-white people at a rate higher than white people. While facial recognition technology is still misidentifying people at an alarming rate, it is still being used by police departments to make arrests. And let's not kid ourselves that this is harmless. There are real-life disturbing implications. For example, in late June, the ACLU shed light on Detroit citizen Robert Julian Borchak Williams, who was arrested after a facial recognition system falsely matched his photo with a security footage of a shoplifter. The incident sparked lawmakers last week to propose legislation that would indefinitely ban the use of facial recognition technology by law enforcement nationwide in the U.S. Though Amazon had previously sold its technology to police departments, the tech giant recently placed a law enforcement moratorium on facial recognition. Microsoft and IBM did the same. First, As Robert's experience painfully demonstrates, this technology clearly doesn't work, at least not right now. Study after study has confirmed that face recognition technology is flawed and biased, with significantly higher error rates when used against people of color and women. I totally agree that we need to take a step back here and look at what we work, what doesn't work, and how this ties together in an era where privacy is a concern for all of us actually. So let me know what you think about this story that seems like it comes straight out of Tom Cruise's Minority Report. What do you think about facial recognition overall? What do you think about the findings that it tends to be racially biased? And finally, let me know what you think about this from the perspective of privacy. So yep, share your thoughts. Let's chat. Gabon has appointed its first female prime minister, guys. Her name is Rose Christine. She is the sixth prime minister appointed by the president of Gabon, Ali Bongo, since Bongo succeeded his father in 2009. Her first job is going to be to form a new government after her predecessor, Julian Nkoge Bekele, stepped down last week. She has two major challenges ahead of her right away. The first, declining oil production and prices, which have weighed on growth in recent years and the second, the COVID-19 pandemic. Gabon is a country along the Atlantic coast of Central Africa and has nearly 6,000 cases of COVID-19 to date. Prime Minister Christine previously served as the mayor of Libreville, where she was the first woman to hold that position since 1956, and then she has served as the country's defense minister from February 2019 to July 2020. Congratulations! This next story is kind of fishy. Researchers in Hungary were trying to save the Russian sturgeon from extinction. 
Instead, they accidentally created the hybrid strudelfish. It is a hybrid between the American paddlefish and the Russian sturgeon. Both the American paddlefish and the Russian sturgeon are two extremely old, well, I mean, they're what you would refer as fossil fish. They developed in different parts of the world, as the name suggests, I mean American and Russian, and they have never been bred before. But they have distant genetic connections as members of a broad category of real-like fish that include paddlefish and sturgeons. The accident first happened during a failed attempt at getting the endangered sturgeon to reproduce asexually in a process called geogenesis. The oops babies now have mama sturgeon's bumpy back and carnivorous appetites, along with papa paddlefish's fins and pointy nose, according to findings published in the Journal of Genes. Some look more like sturgeons, while the others favor their paddlefish fathers. Researchers say that they have a lot to learn from their new creations. The strudelfish are now being kept at a research facility in Hungary for the time being. So no, don't expect to see them in the wild any time soon. Now for your weekly fun fact. I bet you thought I forgot. No, I did not. Did you know that the human brain is able to process entire images that the eye sees in as little as 13 milliseconds? According to researchers at MIT, this ability to identify images that have been seen so briefly may help the brain as it decides where to focus the eyes, which tend to dart from point to point in brief movements called fixations about three times per second. So, deciding where to move the eyes can take 100 to 140 milliseconds, so a very high speed understanding must have occurred before that. Anyway, I thought that was really cool. So back to our very last story for the week. I thought that was really cool. Anyway, on to our very last story for the week. So finally, because we're in a very fishy episode, there are now terrifying photos to show us what ultra black fish look like for the first time. These ultra black fish lurk at some of the deepest parts of the ocean and are among the darkest creatures ever found. They have evolved to camouflage themselves to predators, even with no sunlight. According to a study published in the current Journal of Biology, there are certain exotic species of fish that have adapted the shape, size, and pigment of their skin to absorb 99.5% of the light that hits them, making them about 20 times darker than everyday black objects. Scientists at Duke University and the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History studied 16 species of ultra black fish. I didn't even know there was one, but they studied 16. These include the fangtooth, the Pacific black dragon, the angler fish, and the black swallower. They were located in the waters of Montney Bay and the Gulf of Mexico. I don't know about you folks, and when you look at the pictures, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about, but these things look scary. Okay, they look scary. So for those who may not have a chance to look at the pictures, imagine a piranha, but really dark and much more scary looking. Yeah, that's what it looks like. Anyway, I don't know about you guys. I don't like fish anyway. So I will be staying away from the deep, dark depths of the ocean. Anyway, that's it for this episode. Thank you guys so much for joining me every week. Um, Happy to be a part of your Monday or whichever day you listen to it. You don't need to listen on a Monday. But thank you so much. Have yourselves an amazing week, an amazing day, an amazing, you know, just be amazing. Thanks and goodbye. For listening friends as a reminder the podcast is released weekly subscribe or follow across social media to be notified when a new episode is released overlooked is a tunuka media production which also includes shows like africa in my kitchen with more on the way follow tunuka media on instagram youtube facebook and twitter to connect to say hi or to be on the forefront of upcoming shows and program schedules until next time i'm your host yemi 
wishing you a better tomorrow.